everyone. Well, we've got a little hands-on video today, and what we have here is a very cheap hair dryer from Argos. About three pounds sixty, it cost me. I know it's a serious lot of money. And what we're going to do with it today is we're going to modify it to run off twelve volts DC as opposed to two hundred and forty AC. What I want to use this for is for blowing vermiculite or some other, you know, granular or particular insulate material into a confined roof space that can't really be reached by hand. Now, why are we taking away the mains capability? Well, mainly because we don't want this to heat anything. We don't want it to be a hairdryer. We just want it to be a blower. So all we're after, really, is the 12 volt DC fan that's in there. What's actually extremely clever about these is that they managed to convert 240 volts down to 12 by tapping power off the heating element, which is rather clever. And then there's just a simple diode rectifier in there to convert it down to DC to run the motor. So what I want to be able to do in the attic is to be able to run this and one other hairdryer, just modded in the same way, uh, from my bench top, you know, 12 volt power supply. So anyway, let's crack on. Here is one that I made earlier. On the back here, plain as daylight, two banana plug connections and a nice clunky switch. And on the top, the more astute among you will realise that I've done this the wrong way round. So I'm going to have to change this so that the so that this bend here is facing the other way. But you get the idea. But you get the idea. Air blows in through here, the miculite pours in through there, and hopefully we should get quite a strong uh, flow coming out the other end. So what do we do? First things first is we take the mains plug and we snip it off because this thing's never going to see mains voltage. Same they don't use plugs that you can remove using a screwdriver and then add to your useful collection of plugs. However, there is a 12 amp fuse in there which I'm going to keep. Now the incredible thing about hair dryers is that they pretty much run off the same bits, broadly speaking. And one of the most annoying features is this unusual screw which requires a special screwdriver. I'm sure you could probably pick a screwdriver that would work for these four mere peanuts off eBay. Uh, however, I don't have the time to do that and uh, it's not every day that I uh, mess around with hair dryers in this way so I'm just going to drill out the holes. I'm just going to drill the screws out and hopefully I won't damage the uh, enclosure too badly. Just got to be careful while we do this so that we don't damage vital components. We don't want to go all the way through. We do want to destroy that annoying screw. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Nothing like a bit of brute force to sort that. Okay, so yeah, we've got that. Well, we don't need that anymore. And here's the, the crux of it, really. Now, you might have noticed that on my uh, previous attempt at doing this, I installed my own switch. Well, what's the point in doing that when they provide a perfectly good one for you to use here? We've got a polyester cap here, 0.1 microfarad. That's probably just smoothing the AC coming in. This is quite unusual, but I believe that this is a selector switch that allows you to choose between European 110 volt and UK 240. So yeah, we don't need that. So the trick is mainly just to separate all the bits and pieces. So I'm going to sever all the wires right at the point where they connect up to the coil and other components in the head and snip them off just like that. Now the coil will lift up and it's still being held in place by four diodes and there's a little tantalum capacitor in there which I assume is just, again, smoothing or ripple or something. I don't really know, to be honest. Now, I can't help myself, but I always desolder perfectly good components and add them to the parts drawer, which, so that's what I'm gonna do now. The solder wick that I'm using is made by a company called Chemwick, Chemtronics. Can't really tell you any more about it, but if you, you can get this stuff dirt cheap on eBay and it's the best solder wick I've ever found. There's a video by Paul Kennett on YouTube. I'll leave the link in the description and he pretty much does exactly what I'm doing here. Just nice to uh, see his take on it. I hadn't actually seen that video um, when I was doing the first one, so I sort of had to find this all out for myself, but he just throws in lots of little useful pieces of information um, that are relevant to his application. I was mainly just removing that solder just for later, for when I want to connect my own leads to it, but now I'm just snipping out the diodes and the cap. And there you have it, here's our DC motor. Uh, there's a little red mark here, 
which shows you the positive terminal on the motor. First things first, just check that the motor actually works. Oh, that's lovely. Brilliant, fantastic. Right, well in that case, next thing to do is to snip away all of this wiring in here, just so that we're left with the two original mains wires coming in at the bottom. And uh, I've decided on this one that I'm gonna leave this cable in and attach banana plugs to the end and obviously just run 12 volts DC through it. On the other one you'll have noticed that I, I used the banana plugs on the other one because I thought it would be easier. This time I'm just going to make use of this cable, just economise on what we've got. What we've also got here are these horrible screws still sticking out so I'm just going to manually unscrew them using a pair of pliers because quite frankly they're metallic, they're difficult to deal with, they're sharp, they're horrible. I won't be using them again, so I'm just going to get rid of them. Just having a closer look at the switch, which I do want to use. We've got a diode soldered across the two terminals at the top and nothing at the bottom, so it's a three pole switch. And uh, I think I'm going to leave that diode in there because it's stopping current flowing to that side of the switch. It's there for a reason, but I just want this to turn the whole thing on and off. Right. So using the continuity test, so we're just going to work out what's doing what. All this diode is doing is differentiating between speed number one and speed number two. Well, this thing's only going to be one speed. When speed number one is selected, continuity between this right-hand pin and ground is uh, cr established. Just making a judgment call, I think. Position number one sits in the very middle. I'll make that the one that we use. So I'm going to remove this diode. There we go, that's that pesky diode removed. One thing that makes these things a little bit harder to work on is that they use uh, quite high velocity solder. What I mean by that is that they, t they use large amounts of solder that requires enormous heat. Um, takes quite a lot of time with my iron just to uh, get it undone or into the solder wick. And uh, what well, that results in two things. It results in anything that's nearby and made of plastic to melt. So quite often my solder wick looms will always have just little little bits there where you know everything's got a bit hot. Likewise with this switch the terminals have started moving around because of the plastic. So just to be sure I'm just going to test the continuity again to make sure I haven't wrecked the switch. If I have wrecked it it really doesn't matter. That still fits in there quite comfortably. So I'm just offering that up as any man with a scrap of common sense would do. Building a little bit of fudge factor so using more wire than I actually need to. Just setting the mouth of my wire strippers so roughly the size of the core of the wire. Just going in there and stripping the ends off. And I'm going to have to do this a number of times and I won't show you each time because it's boring, but there we are. Twisting the ends of the wires and another thing that I always do now, even with something as botchy and as simple as this, is I'm going to add heat shrink to every connection that I make. I'm just using a pair of bench hands here just to hold everything in place once I solder. Now my old man always taught me when it comes to soldering two pieces of wire together that the connection should be physical as well as the solder and the solder is just holding everything in place. In this situation I have to disagree. I'm literally, I'm literally just, you know, Putting them, they're touching each other, they're resting together comfortably. So long as we heat the work properly, then the solder should flow through and around both pieces of copper and fuse them together forever in holy matrimony. One mistake I always make is I always shove the heat shrink on too quickly whilst the work is still hot and it starts shrinking when you don't want it to. Now there are lots of different ways of applying shrink wrap. You could use a hairdryer that still actually heats things, or in this case I'm just going to give it a quick lick of a flame, and that, I've got to do it sort of on both sides, and that should, that should do the trick. You 
should never assume anything in electronics. The moment you assume you know where something is or how it works, then you're making a mistake. So, you know, even though I've already checked this three times already, I'm still just double checking the continuity of the switch so that the correct position is used when I connect up the terminals. It's just good practice, really. And another piece of common sense, make sure that the shrink wrap that you want to use will fit the terminal that you want to apply it to and put it on the length of wire before you solder it up. Because otherwise you'll feel very silly. Pop that on there, stick this through the terminal. I don't mean, I don't mean to patronise when I give out little bits of advice. I don't know what level you're at. I find the best thing is just to uh, keep it self-explanatory. Obviously the reason why I'm using this thie weedy little yellow wire is because we're only talking 12 volts. Uh, I know I know for a fact because I've measured my previous modification that uh, the motor when functioning draws quite a lot actually. One and a half amps I believe. So uh, I think my bench top power supply is up for it but at the end of the day my power supply is a hacked ATX power supply out of an old computer and didn't cost me anything to make so if it blows up it'd be a real shame because it's a great power supply but financially I haven't lost anything it's only time so yeah I've just done one example that's my first connection okay here's a little bridge here I'm gonna do the same now for the terminals the motor and everything else and I'll speak to you when I've got it all hooked up Yeah, I mean, you could argue that what I'm doing here is overkill insulating every joint, and I'd certainly be inclined to agree with you. However, I do believe that if you're ever going to do something, be it anything, that you should do it properly. And I know we're not dealing with dangerous voltages here, but uh, I want this to work, and I want it to be tidy. I want to be proud of this. It's almost more satisfying for something so simple. It doesn't matter how simple your project is. It's got to look nice. Most of the things that I've made like this, I've always gone with the attitude of, well, it doesn't have to look pretty. It doesn't have to look pretty, it just has to work. Sometimes prettiness and integrity go hand in hand. So on this occasion I'm really going to town because I don't want this thing to give out on me because something inside has short-circuited because I was lazy doing this whilst I'm stuck up in the middle of the attic in a claustrophobic roof space firing vermiculite all over the place, all over the shop. It's very therapeutic this kind of work. Very rewarding. So on this occasion whilst collecting up to the motor I am making the connection physical, but that is to save space more than anything so that the heat shrink fits on like I want it to. And hey, look, this isn't meant to be a soldering tutorial either, but I'd also always recommend that you heat the work sufficiently so that the solder flows onto the work and around the work and you can really get that sense of it all fusing and bonding together. You should not be using the iron to melt blobs of solder onto whatever it is you're doing and hoping that it'll all stick together. Also be careful when doing your heat shrink as well so that you don't damage or melt any of the other components that you're using. Just quick bursts. You know, yeah that flame was touching the motor but not enough to all the new Demar. It's a beautiful connection, but sometimes necessary to reinforce with more solder. Right, so now it comes to putting everything back together again. One of the most frustrating parts of this job is getting everything to fit back in again. It's always possible, but just a little bit annoying. Especially when you've got, you know, free floating parts that aren't actually 
uh, attached like the switch and the motor assembly. <laughs> it's very important. You'll have noticed me trying to shove it on like that. That's wrong. It goes this way. Sorry folks, that was silly. Also, when you press this part back in, just lightly, it won't click. If you line up all the grooves correctly, it shouldn't move around under normal GRS. That's better. Whew. Switch works. Uh, so obviously before we seal this up, forever, I'm um, just gonna apply some power at the other end. See if anything happens. So yeah, I'm gonna take my mains wire, take my side cutters, snip down the centre. You'll probably mangle both wires in the process, but it doesn't matter. I'm not doing this is stripping away. Pull those two apart, like so. We're not dealing with mains voltage, so we don't have to be too wary of neatness, as I keep saying. Sorry, I repeat myself. And strip them down. And yeah, I am going to put banana plugs on here so that they'll plug into my supply. That makes perfect sense, but. Just for the sake of doing a test, let's make sure that this is all right. That is doing what we want. Now obviously as the uh, screws have been buggered, I'm just going to take some insulting tape and wrap that around. Right, I am back from the shops and I've just bought myself a two colour coordinated banana plugs that allow stacked connections. That makes sense. I did there. The whole thing was never going to work until I got the entire piece of metal up to temperature. Finito, nice and simple. There we go, one final test. It works! So I just cut a little chunk out of the original piece of pipe that I had. Pick that on there. Hopper is now the right way round. Ta-da! Who are you gonna call? What an excellent machine. I'm very happy with that. So there we are, that's a nice little piece of nonsense for your day. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. Be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want more weird inventions using pretty standard pieces of household gear that'll possibly help you out, you know, doing a tricky job. I'll see you next time.